Briggs, Golf Magazine Top 100 Teacher here at beautiful DeBell Golf Course in Burbank, California. We're doing our maiden voyage here with this Facebook Live uh, feed. Um, obviously, you're going to ask some questions. I'm going to give you some answers, and, and hopefully this will work out great. Uh, if you see something that maybe the volume's not good, please let us know in the comment section or anything that you think we could change. Don't be afraid to, uh, to add something there. Um, you know, as we get started, anything goes here. We want to see full swing work or iron play or maybe possibly hitting short shots around the green, sand shots, anything like that will work. Um, don't be afraid to ask any question at all and we'll go through it. Um, one thing, you know, to take into consideration just as we get going here while waiting some, for some questions to come up, I'm on a hole here right now. I've got 125 into the green. I've got a blue flag, which you probably can't see up there. So the pin is in the back of the green. So it's probably what we say like a plus five to seven yards. And as you're trying to pick the right club on the course, these are all really important things to go through. A lot of times I'll end up by the 125 marker and I'm just gonna grab whatever club that is. For me, it's a pitching wedge, which I would usually hit from here. But because I've got 125 and I've got a blue flag, so I'm gonna add five to seven yards, I might be on 132. On all iron shots, not just on a par three, but on all iron shots, you really should take some grass and throw it up in the air and see what you're getting with the wind. You can also look at the tops of the trees um, and see what they're doing in terms of the, the wind movement. So I'm right into a headwind here from 125 to the center of the green. I'm also a little bit uphill. So if I start adding all this stuff together, I got 125 to the middle, but I've got a blue flag, 130. I've got a little bit of headwind, maybe 132, 3, 4. I'm uphill, maybe add three or four more. So what was a 125 shot may very well be a 138, 139 shot. So it's important to do that because if I take the normal pitching wedge, which I would usually take from 125 and I hit it, and I've got the pitching wedge right here, and I try and hit it normal, then most likely I'm going to be a little bit short. So for me, my routine would be I would come back behind the ball. I'm looking at the target. I'm kind of figuring it out. And I've been doing the same routine for the last 20 years, just about. I'd walk into the side. I take my grip. I put my club face and my foot down, look at the target, spread my feet, take a waggle, and then I would hit it. I even have the same finish routine where I drop the club and then I fix the divot and all that good stuff. So on that shot, pitching wedge, landed about six or seven yards short of what would be pin high. And it was because I still had the pitching wedge and it was probably about six or seven yards too short of a club to hit. If I was gonna hit it close to I'd wanna go with a niner. So just as you're playing, don't just take, see where you are on the course, you know, find the sprinkler and no, I can't go 125. Really try instead to take those factors into consideration. One, where's the flag? Two, what's the wind? Three, what is the slope? All those things can add up. If it's cold, the ball won't go as far as well. And if you do that, you'll probably get the right club in your hands a lot more often. That kind of goes with one of the first questions that's scrolling on here. Great. Uh, Joe Cooker, Keeker, I'm not quite sure how to say it, but his question is, what things are going through your head when you address the ball? Okay, and that's a, that's a great thought. I, I would tell you, much better off thinking of positive thoughts through the swing rather than technical thoughts on a backswing. The technical thoughts you should work out when you're out on the range, when you're out in the practice area. You want to go through those things. Instead, on the golf course, you want to be positive. You want to be thinking of things like follow through all the way or accelerate or hold my balance. Those are all great thoughts through impact and into the finish. So when you're standing over the ball, if you're thinking about, all right, I'm going to think a lot about my, I'm worried about my takeaway, whatever that is. And now as I'm walking in and I'm doing my waggle here, I don't want any of that junk in my mind. You know, I don't want to stand over it and right in here start thinking, okay, I'm going to take it in. Or I don't want to be out. All that stuff's going to get in the way of me really focusing and being aggressive through impact. Instead, I would... much better thought going through. So in my routine, it's always get to my balance finish. So I'd be back, I'd walk in, I'd take my right foot in the club and I'd put it down, spread my feet, give a little waggle. Now I'm thinking, okay, let's get to the finish here. Now I'm holding the finish and stop. So that's a much better way 
free to play and be successful is if you have a positive thought through the ball to the finish rather than some weird technical thing going back. You're almost guaranteed to play crappy golf if you're thinking about your backswing. So don't think about it on the golf course. There's a Michael Dubé Dube says any good drills to prevent flipping. Flipping, okay, let's talk about flipping. Really a thing we see all the time with people. So as Casey comes around to the face on view here so you can see what this is, flipping happens most of the time because the body's in the wrong spot. So when you're flipping, your upper body is hanging too far back behind where it needs to be. And the only way you can get to the ball at that point is to throw the club head at it. So what would happen in that case, let's say either I've, I've moved off laterally too far or maybe on the way down I'm, I'm hanging back behind it and that gives me no chance but to flip my hands at it. Instead, we wanna make sure that your upper body, especially with a ball from the ground, really important, my upper body should be a little bit closer to the target at impact than it was at address. So if I start here, let's say, and as I'm swinging, I'm moving through and my weight's a little more forward, now my chest is in front of the ball, that keeps the handle going a little bit longer and it's much easier to go ball turf there than it is if my upper body's behind the ball too much and then I've got no other choice but to flip. So a drill would be, you'd hit some balls and it always loves slow swings and stop swings. Those are the best way for you to get better, is to do slows and stops. So instead of kind of going full speed and trying to kill it, we're gonna hit a little slow swing or a stop swing. So I'd get a short iron out, I've got a wedge here, which is fine, nine, eight iron would also work just as well. And I'd get set up and I'd come down to about here with my hands just kind of over my right leg and I'd wanna feel as if my sternum has moved out in front of the ball. So I go to that spot, do a couple in a row where I feel like my sternum's moved out in front. Good, and then I may even hit a shot from there where I come down, pump a little bit, and then move through. See, it's just a little half swing. I'm not swinging full speed, but I'm trying to get a feel for where my body actually needs to be as I'm approaching impact. And you do those over and over until you feel like you kinda had it, you kinda know what you're up to. And then after a while, what you can do is, let's say you do five to 10 of those, where you're stopping halfway down, pump the arm and hit. Maybe now you're gonna go just a lot slower than normal and try and feel the same thing. So it'd be something like this fast. You know, I'm really just trying to feel the right stuff. So I take my setup and I get ready to go and I go nice and slow. And I feel like I was moving forward and my body's through. And now there's no way to flip if I'm around and in front of the ball. If I'm behind it, I got no choice but to flip. So where your body is is critical to whether or not you're gonna have to flip it through impact as I fix my dirt here. Please do. Casey, what else we got? <laughs> um, Scott Blaney asks, so where is your weight through the swing? Okay, great question. Let's get a little longer club. Let me pull something out that's a little bit longer. Let's say like a seven iron or something. You can see my very fancy staff bag here. It's a Jones bag, which I absolutely love. It takes me back to my youth when I was just a small lad playing golf. I like to carry the clubs or if I can take the cart, which we'll be doing at Bandon Dunes next week. Very excited to be doing it. So we, the question was, Case, remind me again. Uh, where's your weight? Where's my weight through this one? Okay. A little bit different with a ball on the ground than it would be with a tee shot. A little bit different with the driver. But let's do the ball on the ground. So Casey will come back around here for face on. Casey's my brother, by the way. I say my older and not as good looking brother. He disagrees with that. No way to prove it since I'm not on camera. Exactly. But... Let's keep it that way. <laughs> so as we're working, talk about weight now. With an iron, it's a little different than it is with the driver because the driver I want to hit up. The iron I want to go ball turf. We just talked about where your body needs to be at impact when you're hitting to stop the flip, right? So at setup, my weight would be feeling towards the balls of my feet or even even closer to my toes. I cannot stand it when the weight's in the heels because if I sit back like this, essentially what I've got to do to hit it is rock towards my toes and that's a great way to shake it and do all kinds of other junk, which you don't want to do. So we start with the weight towards the balls of the feet. Balls of the feet feeling kind of 50-50. If I'm hitting a little shorter wet shot, I may cheat a little bit and put some weight on the front foot just to make sure I go ball turf. But on a normal seven iron, I would have the weight balls of my feet towards my toes, 50-50. As I move back, we know this right leg and it's been taught a lot that it's gotta stay flexed and it will stay a little flexed. 
but it doesn't have to stay as flexed as it was. And if it straightens a little bit, the weight's gonna come back into that right heel a little bit, and that's just fine. The front foot's gonna go towards the inside of the ball and the big toe. So right heel, big toe. As I start down, my knees are gonna bend and go down and around my feet. And then I do that, the weight goes towards the front of both shoes. And that's really important. I don't want to be going into my heel right away. I'll never bottom out properly. So it's set up 50-50, right heel, ball of the left foot, knees down and around into, into the fronts of both shoes. And then through impact, as my tummy is pushing up towards the target, the back foot you can see is rolling to get on that big toe and the front foot gets kind of flat or the weight goes towards the heel. And that's a nice typical way we see weight move during the swing. The slight difference is with the driver, you may feel because the feet are a little further apart and we add a little tilt to us, that we may feel almost a little more weight towards the heel of the right foot and the front of the left shoe at setup. That just sort of helps me start out the feeling of being able to hit up on it. So that would be the difference between the driver and a full swing with a seven iron, let's say. So I know you can imagine this as being a teacher for a long time, but one question after another here is how do I keep from hitting a slice? Oh, the dreaded, <laughs> right? So let's talk about the slice a little bit. Let me get the driver out so we can go through what happens on the slice. You know, the slice is funny. The slice for any teacher, that's our mortgage payment every month. I mean, it's a beautiful thing that it happens. I feel bad that you're struggling with it, but you got to understand the fact that people go about this wrong is why I have my house paid every month. It's a great thing. So let's talk about the slice so that those of you watching won't have this issue anymore. And we're gonna do a little trick here. I'm gonna take a, if I have my stick, let's see if I have it. I do, hooray, I got my stick. Okay, so Casey's gonna come around from down the line and we're gonna talk about what the heck a slice is. So in this case, let's say I'm aiming right down this blue stick, okay? So I got my stick out. There's my target line at setup. Now a slice happens when the swing, the path of the club that's swinging is left of the face. So if you visualize that, the face of the club is here and my club head is traveling across the face. That's what a slice is. Now where it starts is determined kind of by where the face is when I hit the ball. So I might have a slice that starts left. In that case, the face of the club is actually a little bit left, but the path is more left than the face. That gives you a slice that starts left and goes way right. If it starts right, I've got a face, my club face is actually right at impact, but my path is still left of it. So there's different kinds of slices. Any slice what we, that we see that you hit kind of in the middle of the face, face is pointing. That's really important. So the type of slice you're hitting because that'll just make it go further left to start. So we just need the path of the club to go more to the right. So let's say I was swinging down this line and I wanted to take the slice away that is a left starting slice. We know the club as it comes in is going across the ball. The face is left but the path is more left. In that case I'm trying to hit this thing to where the club head would feel like it's inside that blue stick all the way in. If I did that the path will be more right. The face will also get adjusted a little bit to the right and that ball will start much straighter and then it will have a tendency to either be straight or even draw a little bit. Now if you're struggling with a right starting slice that's usually a different issue. That almost always is a club face that's open and that almost always is a grip problem. So as you look at these hands, as Casey comes in closer, the left hand should be so that you can see a lot of the back of it at setup. If you're slicing it, chances are your left hand is too much with thumb straight down and you can see this little part of your grip, your handle, and the right hand is too far over. When you do that combination, you're kind of guaranteeing that the face is gonna get open. You get the face open and then you swing across the thing and woo, we got that big old banana, that's the money maker for the teacher. So in that case, left hand comes over a lot, thumb down the side, right hand feels more under, and now I'm trying to swing what feels to be out to the right a little bit more, and it makes it much easier. Think of it this way. If you're hitting 
the slice, we know the face is to the right of the path, and I don't want to do that. If you just go back to a baseball analogy again, at impact, we'd want the face to feel like it's almost either at the pitcher or even left. And we know it won't be that much, but at the pitcher or slightly left, but the path of the club head is going to the right of the pitcher. And if we do that, we'll always have curve from right to left, and then we can kind of fix where it starts and how much it curves and all that junk. But if you don't fix that combination, you're going to make every teacher you ever see real happy because they'll always have a mortgage paid. Casey, what's next? Um, let's see. Byron Hahn asks, any advice on helping keep the club face closed? I tend to keep it open. And so what I'm assuming is you're talking about keeping it closed in the takeaway. Maybe that's where you're going. Let me get my iron again, and we'll go from there. And so what I've got, I've got my seven iron here, and we're talking about keeping the club face closed. So what happens a lot in the takeaway is people tend to roll their hands as the club goes back. So I'll pick up my fancy little T and my marker here, and we'll put this to the side. And so the idea here is that I don't want my hands to roll. I don't want them to roll. So instead of like from this face on view, if you visualize where that camera is, that right hand is rolling open to where the palm can be seen by the camera. I don't really want to do that. I want the palm to feel like it's staying at the ball there going back. And if I do that from this side, you can see the difference. I keep the palm facing the ball a little bit more and now the face looks a little toe down and that's where we want it. We want it a little bit toe down in the takeaway. That's kind of ideal going back. What's that, Kate? Uh, how and why do I pull the ball on my drive? Okay, so back to ball flight again. So we're talking about pulling the ball with the driver. And again, when we talked about where does that ball start, it starts on the face. So when the, when the face is left, the ball is going to start left. Now, if you're hitting a pull, the path is matching the face because it's not curving at all. So you've got both the face of the club and the path that the club head is traveling is going left. And when you have that combination of face and path left, that ball is going to start left and tend to stay there. And you're going to see that ball go left of the target all the time. You know, first thing to check, ball position with the driver. A lot of times the ball gets too far forward in the stance. And let me get that driver again really quick so you can see this. So if I get this driver out, Okay, and I got this, and what will happen is the further forward I get the ball up in my stance, the more the face of the club has time to kind of keep turning. And you can see if Casey comes in close, if you watch that club face, the ball gets too far forward, that club face has time to get square where it would have been nice at impact, and then by the time it gets to the ball, it's actually left. And not only is the face left, but the club head itself goes left. So if I'm hitting down this way, and we're looking at that face, the face is turning, then it gets too far forward, and now the club head is traveling left, and so is the face, and boom, all of a sudden we got a pull. Make sure the ball position with the driver is just between kind of like your heel and the logo on your shirt. So as I set up to it, it should feel like it's sitting in here, just in front of your kind of your left nipple would be perfect. If it gets too far up, that gives that head time and the face time to close too much, and then I got the pull and I got problems. Let's right. go two more, Kate, while we're at it. Uh, do you typically hit a shank because swing plane is too flat? Totally. Yes, you can. There's four magic ways to hit the shank. It's really wonderful, isn't it? You got four. The good news is you can only do three at a time. So you got that going <laughs> for you, which is great. So a shank happens when, number one, first thing you can do is start too close. Right, so I start too close, I come through, I got no room, club comes in, boom, shank. Get too close. We talked about that a little bit before about where the weight is. If the weight's sitting in the heels, I'm gonna swing and my weight's gonna go to my toes, now I've gotten too close, I can shank it. And here's the one that you can only do one of. You can shank it being too flat. If I come too much this way going back and I'm coming in from inside too much, it's pretty easy for the club head to swing away too much and I can shank that. El Josel. El Josel, the chili peppers, we know that one from <laughs> Pin Cup, right? So that one happens, usually accompanied with thin divots, you know, not very much of a divot, that kind of contact. The other one is too far from the outside or too far steep. So if I'm coming here too much and the club heads to the right of the ball, you can see where I could definitely find the hosel that way as well. So the good news is you can't be too flat 
inside and too steep outside at the same time. You can start too close and get too close. Those things can happen on the same swing. And one of those other plane issues will cause that problem. One more case, let's go. Uh, do you want a real question or a jokey question? Oh, give you the real question. Uh, let's see here. Uh, any tips for hitting the irons straight? Oh man, <laughs> you know, it, it's like any club. You know, your combination of face and path have to match each other. So, first thing is a good grip. You know, a steady, solid grip. The second thing is that the top. We don't want to see too much of the left wrist cupping. We don't want to see too much of it bowing. That messes with the face. And then as the club comes in the ball, we don't want the path to be too outside, too inside. If I'm neutral. The more neutral I get, the easier it is for me to hit a ball on target and stand target. So that's the thing about all clubs in the bag. Make sure all of the basics are there. The grip is good, the ball position is good, and you take care of face and path with a good wrist hinge that isn't too bowed or, or cupped at the top, and the club is coming in on a nice angle, and the ball will go mostly straight. You want to hit, hit me with that weird question, the funny question? Must be a Tiger fan, I'm assuming. Okay. How do you win 14 majors and 79 times on the tour? How do you do that? If I knew, I would have done that already. <laughs> you wouldn't be talking to me on a video phone. I would phone. not be talking to you on a video phone. Just like Weisskopf said in 86, if I knew how Jack you know, made a swing in that situation on 16, I would have done that myself many times. The basic idea is this. You do it with a phenomenal short game. You're a great putter, and Tiger, under pressure, probably made more big short putts than anybody I've ever seen. The other thing you have to do is be really smart, and Tiger doesn't get any credit for this. He is so smart on the course. You never saw him blow a lead because he always played aggressively to conservative targets when he had a lead. So brilliant, just like Jack did. He would never have made the mistake Spieth made this year at Augusta of missing it short right. He would have been on the left side of the green with that shot. It would have been 40 feet from the hole and he would have had some style. We would have seen you know, one of these with a little spin because he, he was owning being conservative but also winning the tournament. So he was really, really smart, great short game. And just, you know, he's special. I mean, the guy is easily, if he's not the greatest player who ever lived, he's certainly in the, in the top two or three. And that's how you do that. So I have no clue, you know, how I would ever do it, but that's how Tiger did. But I think that's about it today. So I hope everybody enjoyed our first maiden voyage here of going live on Facebook. We're going to do it again next week. So make sure you tune in. It may be closer to noon Eastern, but that's when we're going to go. And I uh, look forward to seeing everybody then. Have a great week.